Welcome everyone to the June 2022 meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. I'm your host, Jeremy Veldman. We're back to Zoom again this month, and we got a great pre presentation for you tonight. Our speaker's from Dallas, Texas, and he's going to give us a, a background on imaging planets with a Dobsonian telescope. So if you're interested in astrophotography, I think you'll get a lot of value out of tonight's meeting. But before we get started, just a few preliminaries. So first of all, again, we're the Memphis Astronomical Society. We are a nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education in astronomy and related sciences. If you would like to engage with us, just go to our website, memphisastro.org. You can also find us on social media. We're on Facebook at groups slash Memphis Astro. And of course, our YouTube channel is Memphis Astron Society. So if you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to this channel. You'll find videos of our past meetings as well as other events that we've done around town, observing events, just anything related to our organization. So be sure and check that out. And again, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And to our 2,700 or so subscribers, again, want to say thank you. And again, I hope you get a lot of value out of tonight's meeting. Now, when you go to our website, memphisastro.org, if you would like to join our email list, just click on the join button. You'll see it in the upper right, as well as on the right side there. It'll take you to a separate page and you can just fill out your details there. We'll add you to our email list. And again, we send out emails about once a week regarding updates on upcoming meetings, as well as outreach events, observing events, just anything related to what we do in astronomy. So. Yeah, if you're not already and you'd like to be on our list, just, just go to, again, to our website, memphisastro.org and click the join button. Or you can go to joinmas.com and enter your details there, your name and your email address. Either way, we'll add you to our list. Now, if you are interested in outreach activities, you'd like to schedule something and have us come out and bring our telescopes and present to your group or just host an observing session, go to, there's actually a link on our website to do that as well. Again, in the upper right, if you click on the contact, it'll bring a drop down menu, schedule talk or telescope. And uh, there you can, you'll be taken to a separate form that you can fill out. And this really just helps us more or less understand how we can better serve you. So the more information you can give us, the easier it'll be. Again, this is one of the things that we do uh, around town as well as the surrounding areas of Memphis as we do outreach activities and yeah we've had a lot of success doing this and helping out other groups so again if you're if you're an organization and you'd like to schedule something with the MAS just go to this link on our website and fill out your details and we would be happy to set something up all right calendar of events June is Kind of a quiet month compared to what we did last month, we do, but we do have a few things coming up that I want to bring to your attention. So, of course, tonight is June the 3rd. We've got nothing going tomorrow night. We did have to cancel Pints and Mounds. But next Friday the 10th, we are scheduled to be at German Shire Park. So and we're going to need telescopes for that. I'm planning to be out there. we got a couple other people. But if you're local to Memphis and you can bring your scope out, again, next Friday, to German Shire Park, then we'll, we'll take it and we'll send notices out again about this as we get closer to the event. And we'll talk about the astrophotography group meeting here in just a little bit. We do have a dark sky observing session scheduled toward the end of the month on June the 25th. Again, the full moon, we're, we're, we're getting into the moon cycle now where it's, it's waxing. So we got the full moon coming up on the 14th, which is the middle of the month. So not a lot of dark sky stuff is going to happen this month. Now, if you're into lunar, and I'm starting to get into lunar more and more, now is a good time if you want to study uh, lunar geography and, and some other things. But yeah, as far as deep sky and dark sky stuff, not, toward, not until we get toward the end of the month. So, and again, we'll send out notices regarding this. By the way, if there are any members of the outreach team on, have I missed anything? Just uh, let me know. I think, we good? I think you're good for everything that is currently confirmed. Okay. And I think 
Now, once again, we have a dark sky observing session the weekend of July the 4th. I think July the 2nd. I got to check the moon phase as well. Uh, well, okay, so new is the 28th. I guess it'll start, it'll be starting to get brighter again. So looks like we only got one coming up, which is the 25th. So, but again, we'll, we'll send out notices as we get into the month. And speaking of outreach, I did want to highlight a couple things that happened this past month. So we had a great observing session at Bobby Lanier Park uh, a month ago, and a lot of scopes came out. I think we had like 12 people come out with their telescopes, and Stelina was there, and we had quite a turnout as well. So this turned out very good. So I want to, again, say thank you to everyone who who came out, all the volunteers who brought their telescopes as well as did other things related, related outreach. So I'm sure we'll do this again soon, but it was a really good night. So yeah, it was great. And we did, you know, the, the lunar eclipse didn't quite work out the way we had thought. We were more or less clouded out. However, some of us saw it. In fact, I think most of us did. The clouds kind of parted midway through the partial phases. And we did, we were able to see pretty much all of max eclipse before the clouds returned shortly after uh, max eclipse ended. So from roughly 9.30 to midnight central time, more or less, we had a, a clear view of the eclipse. So it actually worked out even though our public outreach events were, were canceled. So, so yeah, if you saw it, yeah, that was great. And I do want to give a special shout out to Michael O'Rourke. He, he lives in Louisiana, just east of Baton Rouge. And he sent me some video footage of Max Eclipse that we were able to put on our YouTube channel. So thank you, Michael. And again, if you're out there and if we have any kind of events like this coming up, you know, we got another lunar eclipse coming in November. Yeah, it always pays to look up and have your camera going. Uh, we'll, we'll take anything you can send us, whether it's video footage or pictures or anything. It's just really neat to see what people can do. So, you know, if you're in your backyard and you're into photographing things, you're doing astrophotography or video or anything like that, and you want to share it with us, by all means, please feel free to do so. We'll take it. So, all right. Um, and then, okay, so Prop Busters is a new site we're, tr we're, we're trying out. And a group of us met this past Friday, and this is up in, up in uh, Northeast Memphis near Arlington. It's a new site. And so we were there Friday night, not quite as dark as Burton's, but still a pretty good site. I was actually impressed with it. And uh, we had a good night out there. And this, uh, this is, gives us some more flexibility and more versatility as far as our observing sites. So if for whatever reason, Burton's doesn't work out or we wanna schedule something impromptu during the week, then this site could be a good option for that. So, so yeah, Prop Busters, uh, I guess we can call it thumbs up, a success in our first trial run out there. And we got another, another option as far as an observing site is concerned. And the one thing about this site is you got a clear view of the Eastern horizon. So, and that's ideal for what's coming up on June the 24th. So again, one of the events that's coming up later this month is a planetary alignment, Mercury to basically all the way to Saturn. And if your telescope is out, you can catch Uranus, the moon, and even Vesta. So this will be pretty cool to watch. Now you gotta be an early riser for this one. So, you know, again, it's before dawn, you know, around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. But June 24th, that's, uh, what is it, three weeks from today, that Friday, if you get up early and look due east, then uh, you should be able to see this. This will be a pretty cool thing to, 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 to spot. So mark your calendars, set your alarms, and Prop Busters might be a good site for that or any other site if you, if you can get to it with a clear view of the eastern horizon hopefully without any obstructions, you know, no trees or buildings or anything like that. So that's why I liked the Prop Buster site for, for, for this potential viewing event. I think it would be a good, a good place. 
but it, you know, any other comparable site, be sure to, you know, tentatively mark that and schedule it because this could be pretty cool to watch. So again, we got Mercury to Saturn and actually Uranus is in there. All the planets are in alignment except for Neptune. So that'll be, that will be June the 24th. And the Tau Herculids. So those of you who got out, I don't know if anybody has anything they want to say about this. The actual meteor storm itself was a bit underwhelming to say the least. Didn't, uh, you know, these things are fickle. So sometimes they show, sometimes they don't show, but some of our members were able to, to capture a few of them. And um, Brian and I were out at Lake Arkabutla and we actually had a great night for observing. So the meteors were kind of a bonus, but some of the other stuff that we saw was really cool. So we, uh, we actually spent most of the night near Sagittarius and Scorpius. And there were several objects I had never seen before off of the, the teapot in, or out off of the spout, if you will, in, in Sagittarius. So there's, if you look on a star chart, there's several dark nebula there. And with a night vision, you can, you can really see those features you know, pretty clearly. So we actually had a really good night, even though the, the meteors were kind of a no-show. They were underwhelming compared to the, the potential hype of a storm. So, but again, with events like this, you just show up, look up, and, and don't get your hopes up. But if you look up, you never know what you're going to see. And even if you don't, you can still have a great night of observing. So anybody else got any comments about this? Anybody else see these? Yeah, we saw 18 of them from our backyard in Bartlett. Yeah, staying up probably till 1230 or so. Excellent. Yeah, these were shorter and fainter, I believe. We didn't really see any, any bright fireballs, but they were dimmer fainter but there were a few yes there there's a, a few good ones <laughs> yep but very faint the rest yeah still worth checking out all right and again i want to remind you if you're a member of our society you get access to our newsletter the meteorites so be sure you check out this month's edition and okay, so the other thing I want to make everyone aware of is a new resource that we're starting to use more now. Now, the board members and some other, some of our other special groups have been using Slack for a little while, but it turns out we have a general Slack site now for everyone in our community. And at this point, I'm actually going to turn the presentation over to Ann Viano, who's got a little bit more to say. So Ann, take it away. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I am gonna have to mute my video because I live in Shelby Forest and our internet is horrible, but um, hopefully you'll still be able to hear me as I talk about Slack. So as Jeremy said, this is sort of the, the newest way for groups to communicate with each other. You know, 30 years ago we got email and then we got Facebook and now we have things like Slack so we're trying this with uh, the MAS in general, and I'm going to share my screen here so you can see what I'm talking about. And let me just arrange a few things. So hopefully you're seeing a screen now. If somebody could nod, who has their video on? Looks good. Okay. So... Um, this is what the Slack interface looks like. And it is, it's a desktop app for your Mac or your PC. You can download it for your mobile device, uh, for your phone or for your iPad. Um, they actually integrate with each other. So it's kind of nice that way. But what you're looking at is sort of a general Slack interface. And you'll see up here in the left, it says Memphis Astronomical Society. That is the site that I have activated. And as soon as I'm done with this uh, screen share, I'm going to paste a link into the Zoom chat. That will be your invitation to join this Slack site. But this site has various channels that you can see listed under channels. Uh, the one I have activated is just general discussions. And then over on the right half of the screen, you can just see people are posting questions, comments, 
So you can post text, you can post images, you can post links, and it's just a way for people to talk to each other kind of in real time, or if you don't want it in real time, you can just come to it whenever you want to, maybe on your lunch hour, and you can catch up on what's been, been happening on the Slack site. So here's an example, we were discussing, you know, an article about the web telescope. And so people talking about that kind of back and forth. So this is a way for us to interact with each other between general meetings, if we want to keep the discussion going, or if something happens in the news, or if you have a question about something related to astronomy, you could post it here. So we have a channel for general discussions. And then we have a channel, I just click on it and it pops up for uh, discussions about telescopes and equipment. And this has been a pretty active channel. We have members who are designing parts for telescopes and talking about different settings for different pieces of equipment. Um, we were talking about making solar filters for binoculars and you can see someone posted a picture on how they did it. So if you're interested in things about equipment, you can post here and, and chances are someone will respond and say, you know, this is how I did it or here's a suggestion. We have a channel here for meetings, so information about our general meetings. So here I posted about tonight's meeting. If you can't find the email because it's lost in you know, the 50 emails you get every day, you can come to the Slack site and you'll find a link for the meeting. We also have a channel for our observing events. And this is a really great way for all the people who are volunteering at a particular observing event to kind of talk to each other. Sometimes we'll post a satellite map of the site show you where you're gonna park, where we're gonna observe. If you're lost at the event and you can't find someone, you could post on this channel. They'll, you know, everybody will get a notification on their phone and someone can answer right away and say, you know, go past the fence and to the left and you'll find us. We have a channel here just for questions. You saw something in the news and you have a question, just post that question and chances are someone's gonna respond. And then there are a couple of channels you'll see here on the left, they have a little padlock icon. And those are locked channels that, um, oh, sorry, I don't wanna show the channel because it's a locked channel, but so different groups of people are working on projects. So we have several people who are working on a project for a 24 inch Dobsonian and they work together in this channel. And I'm not a member of that channel, but I'm the administrator of the site so I can see it. Um, we have a channel for our outreach team. We have four, MAS members who work together planning these outreach events. And ideally we work together in this channel. And we can add channels as time goes on. If you find it, we find a new topic that a lot of people are interested in, we can certainly add channels. So right now we have these five channels. Uh, we can certainly add more. We have maybe members right now on this general MAS Slack site, and we're gonna invite everyone to join be a part of the discussion. We have a couple of other Slack sites. So once you download the app and you add the sites, you see them showing up on the left. I actually have five different Slack sites. Uh, this is the one Jeremy mentioned for the board of directors for MAS. Our astrophotography group has a really active channel. Um, sometimes it's so active, I need to turn off my notifications because it gets so busy. Uh, we talk about how to do image processing, problems with our cameras, uh, telescope issues. It's a very active site. And maybe even after today's presentation, you're gonna get excited about astrophotography and you'll wanna join this Slack site and you could just post on the general site and we'll add you to it. Um, and then this is the Memphis Astronomical Society Slack site. That's the one we're inviting you to join, the general MAS channel. And then I've got two others here that relate to um, my department at work and a project that we're working on. Now, all of these um, different channels will notify you when someone posts, but sometimes that can be annoying. So I wanna show you how you can turn that off. You just click on the channel name and you go down to preferences and it's very, very customizable. So the first thing that comes up is your notifications and you can select if you don't want any notifications whatsoever, you can just select nothing. Or maybe you just want things that relate to you. You can also turn off notifications for specific channels if you want. And to do that, you would click on the channel and then go up here to the channel name and then you have an option here for notifications. 
So it's very customizable. You can get notifications on your mobile device as well. You can set the sound for the notification. I mean, everything you would expect from a modern piece of technology. So I hope that you'll join. As soon as I stop the stream share, I'm going to post a link in the chat. And you can use that link to sign up tonight. Um, all it requires is, I think you can even use your Google ID to log in. And then you can start adding channels. If you already use Slack for your work, to add a new channel, it's the plus button here on the left side. You just say add channel and it will find a workspace. So if you're invited, it will find a workspace. But the easiest way is just to click on the link and set it up, download it on your mobile device or your desktop, however you feel like you might use it. Um, I use it on my desktop at work. I have it open all day and I can follow along the conversation. But if I'm in a meeting or something, I can pause the notifications up here in the upper right. You can just pause the notifications. If, if I'm in class for a couple of hours, I'll pause it for a while so I won't be bothered by the notifications. But if I'm eating lunch at my desk, I'll turn them on and I'll catch up on what's happening on Slack and I can keep in touch with folks and learn the latest and greatest tips and tricks from all of our members. So I'll stop my share there and I'll open it up to any questions while I post that link in the chat here. This link is good for 30 days. So we will probably send it out in an email as well tomorrow, but it's only good for 30 days and then we'll issue a new link if people are still interested in. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to help. Once you get on, you can ask all your questions on Slack and, and I will respond or someone will respond. Excellent. Thank you, Ann. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I'll just keep it open for just a second here. So give me one sec. So Nasser just joined. Thank you. That's awesome. Welcome. You're on the Slack channel. All the way from uh, Pakistan. Fantastic. It's a great way for us to keep in touch. Welcome, Nasser. So, yeah, and by all means, especially when, uh, when it comes to whether it's astrophotography, telescopes, any other content, feel free to, to, um, to share it on, on Slack. And Ann, just, uh, just a quick question of clarity. You have the app for Slack on your phone, correct? Yes, there is an app for iPhone, Android. I use it a lot on my iPad because I'm getting older and my vision is not so great. So the iPad is bigger and easier for me to see. Um, I use it frequently on there, but also on my desktop. Excellent. Yeah, it's just a great way to, to engage and, and uh, just basically have constant communication with, uh, with our group. So yeah, again, we'll show you the, in fact, let me just do that now a second here. So we put the, uh, we put the link in the chat and I'll show you this link again when we get toward the end of the the meeting here, obviously you can't write it down, but we can email this to you. It's good for 30 days, but essentially all you do is click on this link right here. And does this download the app then? To, oh no, you download the app first. And this is how you actually join our Slack site, correct? I think it would probably lead you to download the app if you hadn't already. Okay. So the easiest thing to do is just click on the link and follow the instructions. It's, it's fairly straightforward. It's a little bit of a learning curve, you know, kind of like the first time you used Facebook, you had to figure it out, but now it's it's easy, right? <laughs> right. We're trying to form new habits here. And this is something I'm trying to program myself to do too, especially with the board meetings and getting all the resources that we need to kind of stay up to speed on everything. So the board has been pretty active doing this. The astrophotography group has been doing this too. So we're trying to trying to change the culture a little bit, I guess, for lack of a better way of saying it, and giving, giving people one place where they can go if they ever need to engage with us or you know, get questions answered or share things. So it's just, uh, this is kind of our main hub, if you will, for staying engaged in our community. So again, we'll, we'll continue to present this. And if you have any questions, obviously you can either email us, but this is kind of where you go if, uh, if you want to get in, in, engaged and involved with our community, like right away. So 
again, we'll again we'll we'll continue to review this, but uh, yeah, this is where we're going going forward. So, okay, if there are no other questions. We'll go ahead and move on here. All right, astrophotography focus group. We do have a meeting coming up, I think, in a couple of weeks. Rick leads this group. So, Rick, did you want to say anything about this? Uh, Jeremy, I think um, I had an idea for a topic, <laughs> and you, and I'm not prepared to talk about it because I forgot what it was. But uh, oh, um, ah, I forgot. Anyway, I'll send out a notice. <laughs> but um, uh, on we'll the website, it's, it's, it, it was on uh, color cameras. I don't know if that's still still the case for. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. Um, we spent a lot of time on, uh, you know, black and white cameras, filters, pro post processing, and everything. And we're going to try to uh, shift gears here a little bit and talk about DSLRs and maybe the post processing you might want to consider doing with those. Uh, and then, of course, even uh, color specialty astro uh, astrophotography cameras uh, and uh, any processing. Uh, tips or tricks you may have other than just maybe just stacking and uh, what have you to get higher resolutions and uh, so anyway we'll uh, have some uh, we'll have some people that are very familiar with what to do and, and then of course people like me who uh, typically don't have a clue so uh, come on and join us and we'll uh, figure it out together absolutely where uh, teen teachers and learners get together to learn about astrophotography. So, and again, we do this once a month around the time of the full moon. So in this particular case, the Saturday after the full moon is June the 18th. So we'll send more notices about this later in the month, but uh, you can kind of tentatively plan on this for June 18th in, in about two weeks. So, and speaking of astrophotography, that leads us to our program tonight. I want to welcome Drew Henry from Dallas, Texas. Go Cowboys. And Drew has a unique presentation on planetary imaging with a Dobsonian telescope. Now, I'm a Dobsonian guy myself. My 10 inch is kind of my go to scope. That's the most versatile scope that I own. I use it probably 80 to 90% of the time. I do have a 20 inch, as some of you know about that I need to get out again one of these days, but it's a little bit more cumbersome to use. And I gotta be honest, I know nothing about astrophotography and I didn't even know you could image anything with a Dobsonian, but Drew has a pretty unique process and some ideas to share. And I think you can, you know, if you're delving into the realm of astrophotography, this is a very practical presentation because it can really help you get started and create some pretty powerful images right away. So with that, Drew, I want to say welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for taking the time to present to us tonight. Sure, you bet. All right, let me see here. All right, yeah, my, uh, my name is Drew Henry, and uh, thank you for having me over here this evening. Let's talk a little bit about um, astrophotography with the Dobson. Anyway, I've been um, imaging the night sky for about three years now. I started off with this uh, six-inch homemade uh, Dobson telescope I bought used off of Facebook Marketplace. I was so amazed at what I was able to see with that thing. I was holding my, my phone up to the uh, eyepiece and trying to snap a few pictures so I could show my wife what I was able to see because it was just blowing me out of the water. And uh, that's pretty much uh, how a lot of people get started in um, astrophotography. Seems you got a telescope and you got a phone in your back pocket. All you need really is just a, something to mount your phone to the eyepiece and hold it steady and firm there so you can get some pictures. I've even uh, used this little old, um, Celestron Mini and imaged the moon a few times with it. And there's the uh, mount I use. There's all different kind of uh types of mounts they're different prices and different uh you know different features and everything so just do your research and see uh which one you want if that's the way you want to go with it 
And here's a few of the um, images that I took with my uh, my smartphone. All right, you know, with Dobson telescopes, they're not made for astrophotography. They're um, they were made for the visual astronomer. And a lot of people will be able to tell you that, but a Dobson is able to take some pretty decent pictures of planetary and uh, lunar images. And the main thing about your Dobson telescope, if you're getting into astrophotography, is your aperture or your mirrors. The bigger the mirrors, the bigger your image will be, and the more detail you'll be able to pull out of the night sky. And the quality also has a big thing to do with it. And probably the best mirrors out there right now is going to be Mr. Carl Zambodo's uh, mirrors. Here's one that he made for Mr. Dobson for his 12 and a half inch uh, his Dobson. I think they, I, I don't think he ever used it. He just put it on display. There's some really good mirrors. Anyway, I was telling you about the uh, size is the uh, most important thing. And here's a little display on the sizes here. Uh, we're going to be talking about the 10 inch right here. Now, you wouldn't think two, uh, two inches would be that much of a difference in, uh, in what you can be able to do, but uh, a 10 inch uh, Dobson is able to pull in 56% more light than an eight inch Dobson. And that is one of the Dobson's main features is uh, pulling in light. That's why you'll hear a lot of people call them light buckets. And here's David Carlish. He's one of the best ones I've ever seen. I met him on Facebook in one of my uh, astronomy groups. And he took these pictures here of Saturn and Jupiter last year with his uh, 16 inch Dobson. A lot of good detail on him. He's a good dude. He taught me a lot. Anyway, here's my uh, Dobson we'll be talking about tonight. And what's the first thing I do when I, uh, looks like a promising day is the first thing I do is I pull out my smartphone and I check my weather apps and uh, make sure everything's good. And this one right here, this uh, Astro Spiric is a really good one. It's free too. It also has a... Uh, uh, website if you want to look it up in the uh, on your uh, laptop instead of your uh, uh, iPhone or your uh, Android. That's a really good app. And uh, this Clear Outside is a good one, too. I usually uh, I got two or three of them I use, and I just kind of, you know, gauge it. They kind of contradict each other every now and then, but you'll get a feel for them. But that's one of the main things if you're going to start imaging the night sky is your seeing conditions and your upper at, your upper atmospheric conditions. If you don't have good or better on both of those categories, you're not going to be able to pull a good image out of the, out of the sky. You're just going to be spinning your wheels. So you need good or better seeing conditions for a good image. And then after I see that the uh, weather's good, the second thing I'll do is I'll switch over to uh, Stellarium on my phone and I'll check out and see what planets are going to be in the night sky and see where they're going to be located and see what they're going to be um, at the highest in, in, in the sky. And um, another thing I'll do is with Jupiter, I'll see when it, it, the great red spot, I'll do a fast forward on it and see if the great red spot's gonna be visible or if it's gonna have a shadow from one of the moons or one of the uh, moons transiting. That's one of the things I take in consideration uh, every night so I can get all the good stuff for Jupiter. And the only thing I take into consideration for Saturn is when it's you know the highest in the sky. So it'll, the uh, the atmosphere will be the, be the best for the, for the image. And the way I measure that, here's a few hand positions you can use, you know, to uh, gauge, you know, to your degrees for the night sky. Now, the uh, the position in the um, in the sky with the planets is a is a major thing too, right there with weather conditions. It's called the um, the what is it the uh, field of view? If it's not if it's not like, let me go back here. You see these right here, there's 20 and 40, you know, you got 30 down here. Anything below this 20 degrees on your field of view, you're not going to have a very good, uh, very good image because the, all the, you're going to have a lot of atmos atmospheric uh, disturbance right there. But um, anything above 20 will be okay, but 30 is where I try to go for it. Anything above 30, you're going to be able to get a good image. And every degree higher than that is even going to be better. So the higher, the better. And here's my uh, 
where I go, because uh, I live in apartments over here, I go to this um, field over here next door and I've got a clear shot. That's my Easter sky, Eastern sky right there. When we're talking about um, my imaging locations, we'll take a minute and uh, talk about uh, light pollution, which is a big mi misconception when it comes to planetary imaging. A lot of people think you have to have a dark sky location or anything, but you really don't because um, the planets are so bright in the sky that uh, it doesn't really, um, you, don't, you don't have to have a dark sky location. All my um, images that I've ever took were in class nine skies right here between Dallas and Fort Worth, which is uh, the highest uh, portal rating you can have. And here's a uh, portal class is where uh, you uh, determine how dark the skies are where you're at. But anyway, the reason for that is the three the three brightest uh, objects in the night sky is going to be the moon, uh, Jupiter, and Venus. And the rest of the planets are pretty bright as well. So you're going to be taking really fast uh, frame rates instead of uh, just the opposite from a deep sky, which requires dark skies and uh, long frame rates. And um, here's what you might call the drift method. A lot of people call it the drift method. And this is what I used before I got my um, equatorial platform. And um, all I did was um, I would put my uh, my telescope, the tube, right in, uh, uh, in front of like uh, Saturn or whatever. And then I let it um, drift through my field of view. And while it's doing that, I'll be pushing the core. And I record it every time, um, you know, it goes through. Then I'll stop it. And I'll you know, I move it every time, but uh, that's what they call the drift method is um, when you let the uh, planet uh, drift across your field of view while you're recording it in a video format. And the first thing I get I do when I get to uh, my location is I take my tube out and I put a, this little small fan behind it so it can reach ambient temperature. What ambient temperature is, um, is where you're Telescope's inside your house, and it's going to be a different temperature uh, than it is outside. This um, fan's going to help me reach uh, my my tube and my my mirror to, to the same temperature it is outside. So, um, if you don't do that, it'll get this wavy look like you're on a hot Texas highway, and it, and it won't be very good. So you're going to want to make sure your um, your gear is about the same temperature it is outside, and I like to use this. I got me a, a equatorial platform. This was my second one, and it's a really good one. It was made by uh, Ed Jones. And if you're going to get one, this I highly recommend these. It's got a two uh, motor drive system made out of birch wood, and it's a really good price. And what is a um, equatorial platform, it's going to be um, something you set a, a, a non-driven mount a telescope on that will track um, the night sky on an equatorial uh, axis. Depending on, it'll be have to be um, custom made for your latitude, which if mine is, uh, my latitude is um, 32 degrees. So mine was cut for 32 degrees. And when I'm setting up my platform, what is the two things that I need to do? You got to do the these two things perfectly or it's not going to do good. One is um, I'm going to have to have my, uh, it's going to have to be pointed to my true north, not my magnetic north, and it has to be level as well. You're probably going, you're probably asking, what's true north? Well, true north is going to be different than your magnetic north. And here is a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a, um, uh, Android app that um, you can get that has both uh, magnetic and your true north settings on there. And you also can go right here to this website that I have here. And it has a, um, a feature on here that um, takes the information off your phone or your location off your phone and tells you what yours is. See, I did it here. Mine is going to be um, uh, three degrees different uh, than what my uh, True, uh, my magnetic north is, which is 357 degrees instead of 306. And right here is where you can see it. Where I got my um, my compass at uh, 357 degrees. I made this stand right here out of um, just glue and wood because if you get your compass anywhere around any kind of metal or anything, it starts acting kind of weird. So I made this right here and I put my um, my um, compass on top of there and I get it to where it's pointed exactly at the, the 
357 degrees. And then I got these crosshairs I put on the bottom of my bottom plate. And then I got these crosshairs right here. And while I got this pointed at 357 degrees, I'll line these two up and that'll be about as close as I can get to the right where it needs to be. Then I'll level it both ways there and make sure it's on good stable ground to where it can uh, support the, uh, the weight of my gear. And I put my top plate on uh, my bottom plate. And also um, I drilled these holes in here to match uh, the bottom of my uh, mount to where these uh, foot uh, screws and bolts will fit in the same spot every time to where it's right in the level spot and it's, it's, it's right where it needs to be. Then I just put my old uh, my mount, my mount on there. Then I put um, my tube on top of that, and my Dobson's pretty much put together. And this Mister Y, I got him used as well on a Facebook Marketplace at a really good deal, and um, we make a pretty good team. And after I get him put together, the first thing I want to do is I want to collimate. Everybody knows how to collimate a, um, a a Dobson, so we won't go too much into that, but. It's a really crucial, um, really crucial step. You have to have this thing just laser focused to where it's, I mean, just a fraction off and it can really mess your, um, mess your images up. So you'll make you want to spend a little extra time and make sure that's done properly. There's where I'm just using, I like that whole tech. It's pretty good because it's got that, um, instead of using the thumb screw, it's got these um, rings in it and you tighten it up to where it's not, the thumb screws aren't like, pushing it to one side of your uh, eyepiece hole there, it's it's like perfectly in there, at, in, in the middle. Then I use this tail rad. A lot of people use the the other finder, the uh, the dot or whatever, but I like this tail rad pretty good. And I got a little two inch riser on top of there. It helps me uh, from hitting my head on, on the uh, OTA there. That really comes in handy. But I really like this. Um, it's real simple to use too. It only takes a couple of AA batteries. I think I've had the same batteries in this in mine for about two years now. I've even left it on in a sack and taken it out and it's still going. And then after I get it all collimated and everything, next thing I want to do is I'm just going to put my um, my uh, Barlow and my uh, camera on there. Now there's a lot of places you can skip steps. Um, in astrophotography, you know, and try to save a little money. But optics is one of the things that, I mean, if you could, if you could uh, afford good optics, get the best you can. This is an area that you're going to want to splurge in. And I think Teleview is probably one of the best names out there. This is the regular uh, TV Barlow, but they have a, um, a power mate that they uh, make as well that I think is a whole lot better. But I, but this is what I got. And it's, it does a really good job as well. And this is a camera I use, which is at a ZWO, the ASI224MC. Two, two, uh, two, two, it's got an IMX Sony chip in it. it. Does really good. Really, really fast camera. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's a dedicated planetary uh, imaging camera. And I highly recommend it because I love it. But the one thing you're going to need is um, with these uh, ZWOs, it's going to be an IR cut filter. I got this uh, Bonnie one and this uh, eyepiece uh, uh, thing right here out of Amazon for about 20, it's like 20 bucks. It wasn't that much. But you got to have that on there because it'll, if you don't have that cutoff filter, put a bunch of um, unwanted um, color in there to make it will gum your uh, images up really bad. I know the I got an Altar uh, camera for my deep sky um, um, setup, and it it has an IR cut filter built into it. Um, here's another thing I haven't even used mine yet. I bought it last year. It's going to be a ADC or another day or atmospheric dispersion corrector. And what this thing does, it helps um, uh, take away all that. Uh, all that um, disturbance up in the up in the night sky, to where if you are imaging at a low uh, degrees, like twenty degrees or something, you can use uh, one of these ADCs and it'll help correct, um, you know, 
correct those uh, discrepancies. And um, fire capture even has a, um, a, a a tuning thing on there that that'll help you um, get it right where you need to be. It's got two prisms in it, and you um, have these two little knobs on it. You've got to like um, uh, separate them just at the uh, the same amount on each one, just a little bit at a time until you got like a a perfect color on here. See, how you got blue over here and red. You'll want to get those to where it's blue and red all the way around. And then after I do that, I got this um, uh, this power pack. It's a jumper box I got from uh, Home Depot. And uh, I just plug it, uh, everything into this right here, and it, it powers everything for me. And then I put this little LED light on the bottom of my um, top plate of my um, equatorial platform. That way I can uh, kind of gauge it and watch it. So when I need to reset it or whatever, I'll be able to keep an eye on it. And when I reset it, I can see where I'm putting it. But this, yeah, this little power pack right here, you can, they're pretty cheap. And it, it, it's plenty enough power for it. I, all I'm running is my um, my platform and my um, my computer and with, with, my, uh, with my camera as well. And another uh, thing you're going to want to do uh, if you're doing planetary imaging is you're going to want to, a computer that's it, it, it it's going to be a, a a good computer the one i use is a 10th gen i7 and uh uh upgraded it a couple years ago and uh took the old ssd card out and put a one terabyte uh, card in there and i uh, up my um my memory to uh 34 gigs i said i think it had like 24 in there but the bigger storage space you got, the better, and the more memory you have, the better, because some of those, just uh, some of those files, those SCR files or AVI files, some of them get up to, you know, 20, 30, 40 gigs, just, just one file. And it starts adding up real quick. And another thing about your laptop is you're going to want to make sure it's got a, uh, the, the SUV port's going to be a, one of those SUV threes. Then I use a bat mouth mask when I um, focus my uh, Dobson. Damien P. he's a real famous uh, uh, planetary imager. He says don't use one, but my eyes are pretty bad too. And um, it's hard for me to just like eyeball it. So I use a bat mouth mask to uh, to uh, get my, my focus right. And that's uh, where you get these dis uh, diffraction spots. You have these two outer ones on each side and you only want to get this middle one right in the middle of those two on the outside. William Optics uh, makes a clear one. And I got one of those for my uh, deep deep sky object rig. And the diff diffraction spikes are really a whole lot more profound and it's a whole lot easier. You can get a closer, um, um, you know, focus on it. I haven't got one for my Dobson, but they make them for that as well. And then a few, here's a few add-ons I got for mine. This is gonna be a digital angle gauge. I just slap it over here and it'll tell me what, what uh, you know, uh, where I, I'm pointed out at sky. I can look at, um, I can look at Stellarium and, and it's got uh, the real time coordinates on there. And I can use my digital angle gauge and I can use my uh, compass. And that's how I got my first picture of, uh, of a Uranus right there was with uh, those two uh, tools right there in the Stellarium. Because, I, I mean, I could never have found it if it wasn't for that. But I found it. It's pretty cool. Then I got this um, I got this uh, thing from William Optics. It's, um, instead of using the thumb screws, it's kind of like um, the Hotec um, uh, uh, laser collimator. It's got those rings in it. Instead of having those thumb screws pushing your camera or your uh, Barlow, you know, it's, you know, have that... Um, everything right there, right in the middle, tight and good and snug. It's a really good thing, a uh, really good tool to have as well. And the next thing we're going to do is talk about my, let me see if I can get it right here. I've got to, the software, the capturing, to capture data. Let's see here. Right. 
Now, there's a few fundamental rules that I uh, go by when I'm capturing my data. It's pretty simple stuff. Is um, one of them is uh, the your imaging times, and that's one of one of the main things you need to you know make sure you do all the time because when you're uh, these the planets they rotate you know at different speeds and you know you have different imaging times because if you if you image them for too long the rotation of the planets are going to um, distort your um, your image so you're going to uh, you you want to make sure your imaging times um, you know don't go past your to where that that's a problem and for Jupiter there you know I don't like to go over three minutes because it, it spins really fast. You think over three minutes, you're, you're going to start having some discrepancies. Mars is going to be like, you know, five to seven minutes. Um, Saturn's not, you know, you can pretty much uh, image Saturn, you know, all night long if you want to, but before it does its meridian flip or whatever, um, you're going to want to image it before or after, because if you get up there on the top, at the very top, uh, that's when the rings are going to start, you know, you know doing the dip and um, you're going to want to make sure they're you know going one way or the other and um i really can't get any detail on uranus or neptune so it really doesn't matter venus it doesn't really matter any times because of course it's got the clouds around 24 7 so you're not really going to get any um, um any kind of uh detail out of that but um jupiter's your main one make sure you don't go over three minutes some people, you know, they go over three, four, some people go like 10 minutes because they use wind jupos. But I still stay at three minutes because I can get plenty of frames in those three minutes. And then Mars, of course, you know, I go with, um, which is going to be up this year. And it's going to be pretty exciting. It's going to be five to seven minutes. And then um, the main thing you're going to want to do, frame, your frame count is one of the most important things. Uh, focus frames are as many as I can get is what I'm going for. And you have two choices on your video files. You have the AVI, which has been around for about 30 years. A lot of the old old school fellas, they like, and I see some really good images with the AVIs. And uh, you have the uh, SCRs as well. I, that's who, what I go for is the SCRs. I just, I like using the SCRs pretty good. And Fire Capture is the uh, software I use to capture uh, my planets. There's another software out there called SharpCab. I tried using it uh, in the beginning, but it really didn't, you know, work for me uh, when I started imaging planets. But it, it, it's come a long way in the last few years, and it has a few features on it now that I use for my deep sky objects. But uh, Fire Capture is a really good software to use, and it's free too. All you got to do is uh, download it and unzip it. You don't have to. Uh, um, you know, load it to your computer or anything. It's just in a uh, folder. And what you do, you'll just, you know, click, uh, right click the uh, icon and put it on your uh, desktop or whatever. And um, you just leave everything else in the folder. If you take anything out of the folder, it won't work properly. And he's got some great tutorials on. I mean, he goes uh, over every single feature it has in on YouTube too. So if you have any questions, how to use it or how to load it or you know anything man he's he's got it on there he does a really good job on that they just did a big update on it too which is all right i guess but when you open up fire capture the first thing you're going to see is going to be this um this um screen here that's you know asking what kind of camera you have it's pretty self-explanatory and it also has this dummy uh camera on here as well so if you want to use this camera to you know kind of get used to the uh to the uh, software, you can go in there and mess with everything and kind of get used to where everything is. And then after you use it like one time and you uh, open it back up, it'll uh, automatically, you know, that's uh, what your camera you're using. And the first thing I do when, you, when I open it first, I'll make sure this, uh, I go into settings under settings and I'll make sure this uh, wind two posts where it saves the uh, information. So when I want to use wind jupos. Hey, Drew, uh, sorry. Yes, I mean, oh, oh, yes. I mean, sir, but your slides are not advancing. I didn't know if. Uh, oh, they're not. You need to be in slow in, in uh, slideshow or not. Um, what, what, which image do you have me on? I've got you. I've got you on the, uh, the title image slide number 47, which is the uh, adventures of an amateur astronomer. With, oh. uh, we're looking at the, the, 
actual screen, it says there's an account notice. We've run into a problem with your Microsoft 365 subscription. <laughs> oh, hold on. Yeah, well, see, I just uh, paid my bill uh, two days ago and it's doing that. Hold on. Let me uh, stop sharing and try to reload it again. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> I apologize about that. No worries. Let me see here. Where are you? Wow. Escape. Make sure Joe is still alive over there. I'm seeing a shoe on the floor. Oh, there he is. Okay, good. <laughs> Man, I, Paul, I went through half my uh, second thing there. Let me see where we are. We got time. You're good. All right. Well, anyway, there's where I was talking about your uh, planet times and everything. Can y'all see my screen good now? Go ahead uh, and no share. Your, uh, yeah. Go ahead and share. Go back okay. to share. Oh, okay. Um, in the lower, well, in the in the bottom middle, you'll see a green button that says share screen on Zoom. There we go. There we go. There you go. All right. Yep. Now we can see it. Now we're looking at the um, capturing data. Okay. Imaging here, title fr or time frames. Yes, sir. Here, here's where I was talking about the, uh, the yeah time frames. You know, three minutes for Jupiter, and you know, uh, pretty much endless time for Saturn and Mars. You know, five to seven minutes. And like I was saying. The biggest pile of frames you can get that are focused is, you know, what's what your is what the goal is. The the bigger the pile of frames you get, the better your image is going to be. A lot of people say, "Oh, you know, don't go over this, don't go over that." I don't care about that. I I, I, I just keep going. I mean, the and like I was saying, the two the two uh, choices you have for those video files is going to be the AVI or the SCR, and this is the one I use the SCR. And there's fire capture where we're talking about. And I was telling you, uh, he, uh, he's he got a a whole bunch of, uh, like five or seven different um, tutorials on, fire, on uh, YouTube that goes over, he really goes over everything on it. It's really good. And like I was saying, when you first open it up, it's going to uh, come up with this screen. And it's going to ask you what um, camera you have for the first time. If not, there's that dummy camera right here that you can um, you can utilize to get uh, acquainted with the software. And um, here's where I was talking about the first thing I do is when I go in there is I go into settings and then there's another settings that you, you pop in and um, right here in this when you post you're going to want to make sure that's checked right there. But the next thing I do is I make sure my histogram right here is checked. Which is that right and this is the new interface too. And there's that. The old the old interface had all three of them together, and uh, this the new histogram on the new interface has them separated there, so you can, you know you can see each channel and uh, be able to measure it a whole lot better. And let's see, the second thing I do is, um, uh, oh yeah, I turn my debayer on. It, right here is where the debayer is. It's it's really right here. Where the check is, my arrow is wrong on here. And then when you open up the debayer box, there's this other thing right here that you're going to want to um, check right here. You're going to want to you're going to want to uh, make sure it's disabled, you know, while you're during your capture. So um, you know that energy is going towards your image instead of you know on your uh, live view right there. It, it'll it'll log it'll bog your um your image your uh, computer down if you don't. So you want to make sure that's disabled the bearing while you're imaging. And let's see, you're going to want to uh, put this um, on max right here. That's going to be your uh, your frame your um, your frame transfer speed. And so a lot of some some computers can't handle max, and it, it'll uh, it'll 
you'll have a box pop up to say you need to uh, slow it down your transfer rate and you'll just you know gradually go down until your uh, computer is able to, to um, take the transfer rate and the second and the next thing I do is I go over here to this top box here which is going to be your region of interest and this is going to have a lot to do with your frame count um, the larger your uh, region of interest is, the uh, slower your frame count is going to be, and the, um, the bigger your frame, the bigger your files are going to be. So the um, the smaller uh, region of interest, or the ROI that you use, uh, the better. It's going to increase your frame rate, and and, and you're just going to be knocking out, you know, nothing but a bunch of dark sky that you're not using anyway. And you're going to have be able to. Uh, here's a right here on top here on this uh, left-hand corner is if you want to go 16-bit, but I always keep mine in 8-bit. There's really got no need for uh, to go 16-bit for um, planetary, so I keep it on 8. And now this gain and exposure right here is going to be my the two main things that um the two uh, things that I use the most to um, when I'm imaging. I'll, I'll mess with these the most. And your the higher your exposure is, the slower your frame count is going to be. So you're going to use this um, gain, that gain will help you lower your exposure. But the more gain you use, the noisier, um, the more noise you're going to accumulate in your images. So you got to uh, you're going to want to find that sweet spot, you know, right there in the middle to where you're good, you're getting a, I don't know, you know, a frame count you like you like with uh, the amount of noise that you're going to be uh, comfortable with. But um, that that's one of the reasons why I like a, a large frame count is um, the more frames you have, the um, the more you'll be able to cancel out that noise. So what you're going to want to do on your camera, you, you know, every camera is different, or every uh, like the ZW or the Altair, the Altair cameras, they have their own um, their unity gain or their average gain setting. You're going to want to be able to find that. And I believe on my two two four, it's going to be around. Um, 250 or 275, but um, when I use a bunch of frames, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll crank that gain up to 300 or 350, so I can bring that exposure down, so I can get a higher frame count. And this gamma box right here, I mean, you can use it if you want to, but it's kind of like um, you know using a uh, a larger uh, region of interest than you want to. It, it it's not gonna it, it doesn't help your um your image out whatsoever, but it, it just takes away from you know, your uh, software and your camera uh, from doing, you know, putting that energy somewhere else. I mean, you can you can try, but try, just, you know, try a few of them without it. I mean, you, you'll see what I'm talking about. Then we're going to go over here to our capturing uh, area. Now, the Jupiter right here is going to be like a setting. You have different settings to where for where your file is going to be. And uh, the Jupiter one is going to, you know, it's going to be like a certain amount of settings uh, that you have for like that certain planet, you know, what your your exposure you like or your gain, and you hit the Jupiter and it'll automatically have it set there for you. And you can uh, do one for Saturn and and what, whichever other planet you want. But I, I I just use the same one and it goes to the same uh, same folder. And if you want to use um, filters, you can. Uh, uh, but what filters use, but I, I mean, I don't use filters when I'm imaging planets either, except for my uh, uh, my RI and a UV cut filter for my um, for my camera. And then um, let's see here, like uh, right here is right here. You can um, there's the there's the record button. But right above right above that is your um, limit. You can limit your um, time. So all you got to do is push the record button, and it will um, it'll stop it for you. Like I said. Um, I like to image Jupiter at uh, three minutes. So there I have it at 180 seconds. So it'll cut off for me. Now, if you're doing the um, the drift method, like I was talking about, this pause button works really good because while you're imaging and the, the uh, plan starts drip, uh, drifting out of your field of view, you can hit that pause button and like uh, re, uh, relocate your uh, OTA to where it's going to drift back through your field of view. And you can um, hit that um, play button and it'll save it on the same um, the same um, file instead of ha having a whole bunch of video files that you have to put together later on. <clears throat> oh yeah, I was telling you about where I um, up my um, my computer a couple years ago. That's what I did on on the off season. 
And let's see here. There's just my uh, picture of my histogram and everything. That, that uh, ROI of 640 by 480, that's one of my favorite ones right there for Saturn. And if I can get Jupiter in that, it's really good. Oh, and see the, uh, where these, um, this is where I measure my, um, my, my histograms is um, the, the green channel. I, I have no control over it. You know, it's going to be there. I don't have no way of, of uh, you know, making it lighter or broader, but, um, and the only thing I do with my blue channel is keep it at 99, which is the highest one. The only one I can um, um, control is my red channel. So um, what I, I'll get it on the uh, planner or whatever I want it on. And then of course these will stay there. And then I'll go over there and uh, I'll, ch I'll change the um, my, my red to where, it's, to where I'm comfortable with it. And then I'll be able to um, slide my gain and exposure to where I want it to be. And I, I try to keep it, you know, a lot of people say they like a histogram of, uh, you know, 80, 90, 95%. I like to keep mine at around 75. One reason is, um, you know, the the uh, the darker, you know, the lower your um, your percentage is, the uh, higher your frame count is going to be. And um, if you go up to like 80 or 90%, the, um, let me see if it's on the next one. Oh, that's where I was telling you. Um, I control my red, seeing blue set 99, and I have no way of controlling my uh, green. Um, is, um, yeah, if you go over like 80 or 90% or 95% on your uh, gain setting, when you go to uh, process your um, your image, your uh, your your color weight, you, you, you're not going to want to go over to uh, uh, 1.0. I mean, you know, to, uh, 0 0.2 or you know, uh, 0.11 ain't that bad, but, um, you know, if you go over that, any, anything over that uh, 1.0, you're going to start losing data. So I, I try to keep my uh, my histogram, or I try to keep my settings, uh, my histogram at about 75. That way, when I go to uh, process it in uh, Registex and sharpen it, it's going to um, bounce these up because you know, the auto balance, the reason I'll It'll raise it all up to where it's supposed to be. That's why I try to leave it at a lower rate. So then, I mean, you know, that's pretty much just about it on um, fire capture, you know, push play, and that's, that's about it. And here's going to be the um, the uh, SCR file that we're going to um, process and try to get this image out of on my next one. If I don't mess it up like I did the last one, this will be the last one. Um, Did that one switch over? We see we're back to the the main. Uh, do you see? Do you see where that uh, pip is, and it says Google right there in the middle? No, we're back to uh, the thing with the account notice. I don't know why they keep saying that. Hold on, just a second. How's that? You got to share again. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Now we're seeing the Google PIP plan. Okay, good, good deal. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about how I process my images. Now that we've talked about, you know, how I set my stuff up and then, you know, the software I use and the tools I use to capture my data. Let's talk about how we pro how I process it. Now, processing, you know, your images. I mean, everybody's different on processing images. You know, everybody has, you know, their workflow and they, you know, the way they like to do things. And this is the way I like to do uh, my images uh, to get a image that I'm pleased with. But the first thing I do is I like, um, I like to use this PIP and, um, here's where you can download the PIP. 
uh, off of Google. And this is where you'll be able to find the SCR uh, video player as well. And they're both a, they're both free uh, free softwares. And here's the uh, the SCR file that we're going to be um, um, processing. Right down here, you'll be able to see um, this. This is my frame count right here, thirty nine thousand two hundred twenty six. And you know, if you, it also has a play button here, you stop, you know, rewind. It'll go both ways, and you can go frame by frame if you want to. So, so you, let's say you have have um, if you want to take a frame out because your planet accidentally uh, popped, you know. A, cut off a little bit of it you'll be able to uh, find out which frame that is because you'll have your frame number right there and avi is not able to do that you also appear in your tools you got a histogram and all kinds of different things you can use i just really like the scrs but anyway like i said pip is the first thing i um my, the first uh, software i use and pip stands for planetary imaging preprocessor what it's going to do is it's going to take that video file See how it's down here on the bottom. It's going to put it up. It's going to put it up here in the middle, and it's going to stabilize it because it's going to be when you uh, image planets, it's going to be shaking around a lot because of the atmosphere, you know, problems and everything. And it's going to help stabilize it as well. But when you open it up, this is your first. That's your main screen. And the first thing I do is I'm uh, first thing I do, before I put it in uh, my image in there, or my my video file in there is I'm going to click this planetary button right here, and then I'm going to go over here to uh, this processing options. When I go over here to processing options, I'm gonna uh, work enable cropping. That's always checked. I, I'm gonna uncheck that. But if you wanna leave it, uh, you wanna crop it, you can crop it right there. But I, I like the, uh, the you know the size it is. And that's the only thing I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna go up here to this uh, output options next. I'm gonna go over here to output options. I'm gonna do two things. I'm going to click right here to where it's going to keep it at an SCR file. And then I'm going to click this box right here, which is going to generate the WinJupos um, uh, information for me. So I can use WinJupos. But I mean, if you want to make it AVI or TIFF or anything like that, you can do that as well. I'm going to keep mine as, a, at a, a, as an SCR video file. And then when I'm done with that, I'm going to go right back here to the start page. And I'm going to drag and drop my uh, SCR file in there. And then when I drag and drop that SCR file in there, this uh, box is going to open up. It's going to ask me if I want to uh, use a debayer pattern on Earth. I always click yes, of course, because it's going to be a color image. Then after I do that, it's going to um, this box is going to pop up and see. Remember how the uh, SCR file the planet was there on the bottom? See how it's raised up there on the top, and uh, also gives me um, you know my channel. Uh, See, remember I told you I like to keep it around 75. It's a little higher, but that's not too bad. And it gives me my frame count, my region of interest. And it just it just kind of shows you what you're going to be uh, getting after you uh, process it. Then I'll go here to this last um, uh, tab. If I hit that do processing, and I just hit start processing, and it'll do its thing. And that's it on that PIP. And after it's done, it'll pop up a box with your uh, PIP uh, file in there. You remember me uh, saying about uh, how big the um, the files are? This uh, one pip uh, uh, video file is 33 gigs. And then you think about it, um, the file that you put in there is 33 gigs. So now you got 66 gigs in just those two files. Now the next thing I'm gonna do after, um, after I pip my image is, I'm gonna open up this uh, Auto Stacker 3. We'll talk about where to go get it and everything when we talk about stacking, but we're going to do something here real quick is I'm going to drag and drop this, this sucker in here and I'm going to uh, get this frame count right here. Notice it took uh, a few of the frames out that weren't any good in PIP and um, left the good ones. I'm going to take this um, uh, frame count right here. I'm going to bust out my calculator. I'm going to divide that number right there by two. And then when I divide that number by two, it's going to, uh, I'm going to put this slider right here to where it's the same as what's on my calculator. Because I want to get there right in the middle, but I want to make sure that it's going to, it's going to be a good uh, uh, clear um, image. And if it's not, you know, because some of them are be uh, kind of fuzzy because of the atmosphere, 
I go backwards and I go forwards until I can find a good one that's as close to this middle uh, spot as I can get it. Then, oh, let me go back. You're probably asking why I'm doing this. This, this, this is going to be the, um, I'm going to uh, save this one uh, frame back to my folder. And this is going to be the image I'm going to use for my wind shoe post for uh, derotating my, um, my, my, my video file. This um, middle frame is going to act like the neutral spot for where my first frame and my last frame can all gather together here in the middle uh, to uh, act as, you know, to where it can all uh, join together. So let's say if I try to use a frame over here at the three quarter, the three quarter uh, spot, it'll, um, this first uh, frame, I have so much further to go than this um, one at the end. So uh, that's what I do. I go, I use that middle frame. So, uh, oh, uh, this is where you go to get when you post right here. It's free as well. I mean, all these uh, programs are free, except the one thing I do use is um, cost like 10 bucks a month is, uh, is uh, Photoshop. And then after you get uh, when you post, there's a couple of um, things you need to, uh, the drift charts. So that way you'll, um, when you do your measurements, you'll have the uh, current drift charts in, in your um, software. So uh, when you go for your measurement, uh, it, it'll know where it's at and uh, how to stop it or whatever. I mean, I don't know the technical stuff, but you gotta and um, you gotta download those in the interim in there. Anyway, here's a uh, wind uh, opened up. I mean, it doesn't look like that much, but it, it's a pretty powerful program. This is what it looks like when you open it up. And the first thing I do when I open it up is I'm going to go to program. It's going to, and then I'm going to go to the celestial bodies. We're doing Jupiter. So I want to make sure this Jupiter right here is clicked. And the next thing I'm going to do is we're going to uh, record um, our measurement frame from that frame that we took a while ago, or we got out of uh, auto stacker three. So we're going to go image measurement. When it does that, we're going to go over here open image and there's our image that we took a while ago. We're going to pop it in there. And then it's going to, um, after you pop it in there, it's going to um, show you a stencil of uh, Jupiter. And what you're going to want to do is get these, um, these cloud bands, I mean, and um, this outer ring uh, lined up with your, uh, your frame right there. And a good thing, a good uh, feature they have with when you post is you can hit F11 or you can hit uh, automatic de detect and it'll automatically go there to where it needs to be. Sometimes you'll have to mess with it a little bit, but it, it's pretty good on putting it where it needs to be for uh, Jupiter. And it's and that's the only one it does. Saturn, you're going to have to do about manually and um, the rest of the planets as well. But anyway, here's some of the keys, you know, to uh, move the stencil around, you know, makes it... Uh, the up and down uh, buttons, you know, makes it the uh, stencil larger and smaller and the P uh, clockwise and uh, N counterclockwise. And here's your directional buttons to where you can get it to uh, where it needs to be on top of your, um, your image like this right here. See how I got it just on the outside rim there. And then I got where the cloud bands it's lined up with them. When I get it to where, where I'm happy with it, I go back over to the to the image tab, because we're on the adjustment tab here. You can also make the, um, here's a, uh, make it larger, brighter, whatever, and it won't mess your file up at all. I mean, you, the, you can just do these. It helps you with your measurement. I go back over that in, image and I'll save. You can save it to wherever you want to. I always save mine to, my, to the desktop to where it's easy for me to find. And I'll save it. And that's what it looks like, your saved measurement file. It looks just like the icon for when you post. So what I'll do is I'll reopen when you post and I go over here to tools. And I go down here to derotate video stream. Then when I do that, this top box here, I'm gonna uh, put my SCR video file in there that uh, is pip, the pipped one. And then the second thing I'm going to do is, oh, sorry about that. My wife.
dollar about back is um, the second tab right here is where we're going to put our measurement file. Sorry, y'all. Hello. Hey, I, I'm doing. I, I'm. I'm. I'm doing my presentation. I gotta go. Okay. All right. Bye. All right, sorry about that. Anyway, right here's the tab where you put um, you hit that tab, you know, that's where you put your image, your uh, measurement file in. And then all you gotta do is hit that start derotate video uh, stream. And this thing takes forever, man. Sometimes I'll just do it and then I, I'll just let it do it overnight while I'm in bed. It'll take, you know, sometimes an hour, hour and a half, depending on how big your file is. But when it's done, You'll get you another uh, video file, which is another 33 gigs. So you're looking at a, a, a 30, 60, you're looking at about 100 gigs on those three files. But anyway, your uh, derotated uh, uh, SCR file will have this right here on a DROT. And that's the one you want to use for Auto Stacker 3. And like I said, we're going to talk about it, where to get it. You just Google Auto Stacker 3, and this is where you go to download it. It's free as well. Anyway, open up Auto Stacker 3 and I'll drag and drop um, my derotated, my the DROT uh, uh, SCR file in there. And when I do that, um, you'll uh, right here is where you make sure your planet's um, checked, your dynamic background, and your noise robust right here. I believe the four is going to be like the um, average. And if you're Image might be, or your video file is a little bit more noisy than the rest of them. You might want to raise it in one or two or whatever. You just play around with it a little bit. But um, the main thing is you're going to hit this analyze uh, uh, button there, and it's going to analyze your um, your uh, video file, and it's going to um, determine how how good it is on your focus frames or good frames, and it's going to give you a um, a graph after it uh, analyzes it. And this graph is um, um, marked into four into four uh, spots, vertically and horizontally, and it's twenty five percent up and twenty five percent, you know, to the right. To the right is the number of frames, and the upward is the quality. So right here is fifty percent of the quality, and this is what people usually use as a what determines their. Um, the number they're the how many frames you're going to stack they anything under 50 percent you know it, it's not going to be good enough for your uh um, stacked image but anything over the 50 percent is what people i mean that's what the average some people you know they don't they like you know to go over here and use uh really good frames and that's another um good thing about having so many frames to go through is you have a, a you know a larger choice to go go with and here's what our our graph looks like on um on on our video file and it doesn't look too shabby so this is when we put our alignment points now these these points here um you put them just wherever you want to pretty much but I, what, I, what i usually do is i just let the um the uh software do it itself and depending on how good the quality it is if it's a it's a noisy and it's not that good of a quality you're going to want to use, use less of these um alignment points but if, if you got a pretty good uh, uh video file you you can use you know quite a few but one of the main things is you don't want to get these red dots outside of your planet it's okay if these overlap on the outside, but you don't want these red dots to get on the outside. That'll that'll really mess up your image. And then when I get uh, my alignment points, you know, you know where I'm comfortable with or what I like. And oh, after the analyze, after you uh, hit the analyze, your um, your best frame is always going to be your first frame, and um, the quality of your frames is going to be like you know deteriorate as as it goes down one two three but your first frame is always going to be your best frame so that's the one you're going to hold on my last here let me go answer my door hold on oh. 
Okay, if anybody has any questions, be sure you enter them in the chat. Oh, sorry about that. But anyway, like I was saying, it's okay if these overlap on the outside, but you just don't want to get these um, these red uh, points outside of your image. And then this is when you determine on um, how many, uh, the percentage that I want to stack. Let's see, um, you know, I could go, let's see that 50% point looks like it's, you know, almost, uh, what, about 35, maybe 30. But I'm going to go ahead and knock it down to about 22. Right here's my 25, so it's a little bit over the 50%. Then I'm always going to uh, make sure my normalized stack 75%, and it's going to align it uh, with my RGB um, channels. And of course, it's going to say, and here's drizzle. You know, if, if you want to make your um, your image larger, you can hit, you know, you can drizzle it and it'll make it larger. But I, I, I'll just leave that off most of the time. And then after you got your alignment points, you're near the, at a at a comfortable. Uh, stacking percentage you just hit that stack button and let it do its thing and then it'll shoot out an image and there's where I put our stacked image. it doesn't look like much now but it's fixing to that's what our stacked image looks like the next program we're going to open up is Registack 6 which is going to be our sharpening um, program I, our software I like to use I like a, a auto stack of three for my stacking and Registack 6 for my sharpening and it's free as well. You just Google it, and there it is. And that's what it looks like when you open it up. And you just drag and drop your uh, you, your stacked image in there. And this um, box is going to pop up. It always does. You always hit no. You, you don't want this thing to stretch anything. You, you can do everything on your own. Um, and that's what your image looks like. And then I'll... Uh, Take this right here. This, this shows the full image. And this is where the magic happens. And the first thing I do is I'll, I'll do my auto balance. Remember, this is where the weight of my uh, colors, I didn't want to go over 1% uh, or I start losing data on it. You notice they're all there at the one. And then I'll go over to my histogram. I see that, that that's a good looking histogram. It kind of looks like a shark fin, you know. You know, you got your good, you got pretty good uh, histogram. And this is over here. Is, now we're going to start sharpening the image. And these are your sliders right here uh, to sharpen your image. And the best way I know to explain these sliders are uh, think of them as like paintbrushes. This uh, bottom one here is going to be like your, your boldest uh, paintbrush on the bottom. And it's going to be like your most boldest um, sharpening. And it's going to progressively get smaller and it's going to be your fine, your finest um, sharpening uh, slider there is. So I'm just going to start moving these over and uh, letting this thing um, sharpen up. We'll see how it's getting along and see how I get this next slider to go over to the 100%. And then I go over here to this third one. I go ahead and raise it up to see how the, it's getting sharper. And then I notice it's getting a little noisy they got these denoise right over here. Um, and, it, and it's pretty much the same thing as the sliders. You know, these are going to be your, your bolder um, denoise uh, boxes, and it's going to be your finer one. I really don't mess with these bottom ones because they're so bold. I just mess with maybe like these top three, maybe four. But I usually try to just mess with these uh, first two. So I'll raise this number up here. It's going to help uh, take some of the noise out of there. Because uh, the noise, uh, the sharper you, you or more you use these sliders, the more noise you're going to generate on your um, image. And then also, um, here's another feature on your um, it helps intensify your uh, sharpening abilities on on your sliders. Are the, it's going to be your uh, these numbers right here. You can raise them, and it'll it'll uh, raise your uh, sharpening up as well. And then I'll um, see I've generated quite a bit of noise here. There's um, I can't see because this there's a denoise uh, button right over here. It'll open up these sliders and it'll take my uh, darks and my bright, which will help take that circle out, take a little of that noise out as well. And then when I get comfortable with that, there's a flip and rotate. Notice it was on its side a while ago. I can move that planet, you know, whichever way I want you to where it's at a comfortable uh, position that I like. 
then when I'm happy with what I got so far, I'll just hit that do all button. It'll do everything that I, I just got finished doing. Now I hit save and save it to whichever folder I want to. I usually just save it to my desktop. And that's when I open up my uh, Photoshop. It's, it's like 10 bucks a month, but I mean, it's, it has a lot of uh, good features in it. But if you want a free version, there's always GIMP. It's free. It's a really good uh, software as well. It pretty much does everything that uh, Photoshop does, but I, I never could figure it out. And But anyway, um, this is what my image looks like in uh, Photoshop. First thing I'm going to do is, this is going to be a um, a deep sky object tool right here. It's this, oh, I'm sorry. This is Hasta La Vista Green. I like putting it on my... Um, my planets it helps take some of that uh that green out of there and then i'm going to put a, a color mask on it and this is the one i use right here and i'll just start uh doing these um it'll um every every time i open one of these up it'll um give me a layer and i put it you know i just adjust these to where i like you know get these colors as deep as i want them or you know, lighten them up as I want them. See, see how it's bringing them out each 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 one of those uh, layers. And then when I get to where I like it or the color I like, all these layers I have over here, I uh, hit this. Uh, I right click them. Now I hit these merge visible layers, and it'll merge them all together towards you know just one layer or just one image. Then when I'm done with that, I'll just save the image to my computer. And then another thing I like to do, um, it, I never could figure it out with Photoshop, is um, I send my image to um, a free uh, smartphone app to put my name and, and my information on there. It's a uh, PixArt. <laughs> I really like. I've used that for years, and that's what I, I put my my signature and my information on my pictures with. And there's the finished product right there. Wow. And That's then, great. I mean, and then, I mean, after you're done with that, <laughs> you, I mean, there's an image I took of Saturn, you know, you can uh, merch it up, you know, and there's my uh, logo I put on my back. And then you got, you know, coffee cups, whatever you, whatever you want to do with your images, you can do with them, you know, share oh, them. Cool. <laughs> Love but it. That, but that's it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Big applause. Uh, do we? Yes, thank you. We had, we had one question. Sure. Uh, one of them was uh, when you were talking about using the Batnoff Max for focus. Yes, sir. Question was: do you, Are you doing that on a planet or on a star? Oh, good question. Yes, sir. Um, I do it on a star, and I try to find the brightest star I can find. But in these portal class nine skies, you know, you you're you're limited on your your star choices. But what you're going to want to do is uh, find the brightest star you can possibly find, and um, raise your your uh, gain in your set in your uh, exposure up to where you know you can get a good uh, diffraction um, spikes on it, and uh, you can measure it from there. But yeah, don't don't try to do it on a planet or a moon or anything. You, you know you'll need to try to find you a, um, a bright star. Now I did see a tutorial to where a guy used uh, actually used a um, one of Saturn's moons. What he did is. Um, he blew his uh, exposure up and his uh, and his uh, gain up really high to where it looked like a star, and that's what he used. But I, I mean, I don't know about. I've never done it myself, but I've seen somebody do it on on a YouTube tutorial. Thank you. All right. If anybody has any questions? Uh, just feel free to chime in. So we're just kind of making this an informal Q and A. Sure. I did have one question about. Um, your collimation procedure. I'm just curious oh, yes, to sir. see what other what other people do mm -hmm. and compare it to what I do, especially since I have a 10 inch. Mm -hmm. So obviously you have the laser collimator and it's a two inch, right? Um, no, actually it's an inch and a quarter. Oh, it is an inch and a quarter. Okay. But it, I can, um, cause I, I could have got a two inch, but I just, you know, my eyepiece or the Instead of having to, you know, change out, you know, the um, sizes and everything, I can just slip this in there and then, you know, slip my Barlow in there and everything because it's all the same size. So that's right. why I got the one and a quarter. 
Okay. Well, that makes me feel a little better because mine's an inch and a quarter too. It does. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't. I don't know the, what the different what the difference would be or how it'd be better. But I mean, I know they're more expensive, the two inch. But I mean, this one and a quarter inch does a really good job. Yeah. Well, I think for my twenty inch, I really need a two inch. Yeah, if, if something that big. Yeah, I would, that would recommend it. Yeah, probably a two inch. Okay. Now, for your inch and a quarter, or for your ten inch, can you talk about like the individual steps? You put the laser column in the collimator in there. You turn it on. What's your next step? Sure, sure. My after I put my collimator in there and I make sure it's snug. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust my secondary mirror. And when I adjust my secondary mirror, um, I'm going to um, get that, uh, that laser to where it's pointed right directly in the middle of the donut that's in the, in the middle of my, of, my, uh, of my mirror. And then the second thing I'm going to do is after I got my, um, my secondary mirror to where I want it to be, is I go down and I'll adjust my primary mirror. And uh, I do that by, you know, getting the laser, in, you know, in the middle of this to where it kind of disappears on the middle there. And yeah. um, it's where it wants to be. And then I'll tighten my uh, my uh, mirror back up. And then I also uh, I'll check my uh, I'll check my um, collimation throughout the night, too, because, you know, things like temperature and stuff will change it as well. And I, I might bump into it. And then when I'm, you know, I'm moving my resetting my uh my equatorial platform, you know, it might knock it out a little bit. So I, I might check it one or, one or two times throughout the night as well. Okay. So that's essentially the same procedure I use. And it's a lot easier. I mean, several orders of magnitude easier to collimate a 10 inch than it is a, a 20 inch. My 20 oh. inch has been just a real bear. I'm still learning it actually. So, but man, um, what kind of views you can get with that big old thing though? Like, woo! Oh yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> Yeah. And there's no comparison. I mean, and again, for me, I'm, I'm strictly an observer. So, right. you know, clo close is close enough, more or less. When, when you're imaging, you've got to have it pretty much perfect, but yeah, no, when I go from the 10 to the 20, I get spoiled real quick. So you can just fall into some of these clusters. The 10 inches, uh, the 10 inches are really good uh, all around tops. And I mean, it, it's just big enough to see, you know, a lot of good things, you know, and it's, it's just, you know, heavy enough or light enough to where you can, you know, take it, take it on the road with you if you want to. Yeah. And you get some really good images out with it as well. Yep. I've, I've tried to pick up a 12 inch one time and it almost wore me out. I was like, man, I can't put that in my car. I'm going to yeah. stick with this 10 inch. 10 is as far as I'm going to go too. And oh, I yeah. drive a, a RAV4 compact SUV. It fits in there just perfect. Mm -hmm. My most versatile scope. So yeah, I, I swear by the 10 inch. So and then your um the drift method to, to make sure I understand that too. You're basically, I think this is what I do observationally. Mm -hmm. You 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 put the object in your eyepiece and mm -hmm. then you just kind of let it drift as the right. earth moves, of course, through the eyepiece, and then you're you're yes, recording sir. it, right? Yes, correct. Um when I when I use the drift method, you know, we we're talking about region of interest, the bigger region of interest or whatever. I said we, you wanted the smallest way you can get. If you're doing the drift method, you're gonna pretty much want the, the largest one you can get because you're sitting your 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 OTA in front of the object you're going to be um imaging and you're going to let it drift through your your field of view so the the bigger uh, region of interest you have you know the more time you more data you're going to get and then after it drifts through you you're going to you know push pause or stop you know and and reposition your OTA to where it's you know back in front of it so I mean just over and over it's a re, just do it repetitively okay. you also got you also try to do it as fast as fast and efficient as you can of course because you have the uh, those limited times because uh the rotation of the planets can uh deteriorate your image after a while how often how much time do you have before you have to adjust your OTA do you find um no, it's it's different for every planet. Um, now Mars, that, that sucker moves really fast because you you just like constantly, you know, trying to get in front of it. But um, Saturn, I mean, you got some time there, and then you know, of course, Jupiter is going to be a little bit closer, and it's you got less time with it, and it's also a big bigger uh, object as well. So, but you're only talking a few seconds, right? I mean, maybe well, ten um, seconds. Yeah, you know, I might get maybe uh, between, it's been a while since I've used the drift. I believe I was getting maybe, yeah, maybe 10 seconds, you know, maybe 15 seconds and pushing pause and repositioning. 
Got it. So you're just, yeah, you're basically doing it by hand. And then again, oh, yeah. you know, your, your total um, time as far mm -hmm. as data capture is anywhere from five to seven minutes. So you're right. 10 to 15 second segments mm -hmm. until you have five to seven minutes worth of data. Right. And that should be sufficient for planetary, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. But, yeah. you know, with, with the, with the, with the platform, you know, it, it, it's just so much easier. I mean, it costs it, it's all I think I've spent like four hundred dollars on mine, but you know, I kind of splurged because I bought a, a platform that was cheaper and it was just just a piece of junk, you know, and it wouldn't track the planets properly. So I I spent a little extra those had Jones platforms, you know. I, I those are just some real a really good piece of equipment, man. And and it'll last me a lifetime if you know how to take care of it. And uh it, it, just, it, it takes a lot of the work out of it, but the work is, you know, the more, more work you put into it, you know, the, and you get a good image, you know, the, the greater the satisfaction is the way I looked at it, you know, when I was drift met, when I used the drift method, but um, it, it takes a lot of, you know, the work out of it and you can concentrate on other things, you know, instead of having to reposition your OTA, but I mean, it's it just, a, you know, it's a building process, just like your uh, learning process on astrophotography, you, you're, you're building your gear up at the same time you're learning as well. Yeah, you're, you're building your repertoire as you go. Yeah, yes, sir. All right, let me see if we got any other questions in the... Does anybody have any questions online? Uh, yes, I actually have two questions. Can you... We can barely hear you. Uh, and yeah, ask I, you I, have, I have two questions here. And they're quite basic for me. And uh, first one is about the processing uh, of the image. Actually, I have never uh, worked after any planet before because I just started astrophotography like, like three months ago. And I have actually photographed moon a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I have photographed moon a couple of times. Yes, sir. Uh, through my through my four point five inches reflector. Oh yeah. So there's one problem I'm facing is when I look at the individual images, it's fine. But mm -hmm. after stacking, like when I stack eight to nine images, I see kind of a distortion in the lunar highlands. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's gonna be um that's gonna be a, a chromatic dispersion on the. It's gonna be like on the outside rim or whatever. It's like a little bit more brighter than the rest of the planet. Uh, or it's no. got a it's got a glow to it. Is that what you're talking about? No, it's just not a glow. If that's possible, if it's possible to share skin, I, I have an image with me. Mm -hmm. uh, here you can see uh, this is a stacked image here. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks that looks real good. That looks real good. Real good. Yes, I have I have stacked eight images, around eight to ten images. Mm -hmm. This area is pretty fun, but if you look at this area, this top right corner mm -hmm. this kind of a distortion i'm not sure if it's because of my lens or what, what kind of what kind of uh eyepiece are you using um for your um for, that you're putting your uh smartphone in, on is, is is it a is it a flat eyepiece or is it is it um one of those um like a the the best uh eyepieces i used was the the flat it's called the i forgot what it's like a flat one it's, it's not an oval lens because what it does is when you're um uh, imaging it your outside edges is going to look different than what the middle is because of that that ovalness to it that that roundness to it but if you got a flat lens it's it, it's like the the it's going to be the same focus or the same all the way around instead of uh a, it's going to be a, a different focus for you that uh rounded instead of the flat uh eyepieces so it's because of the lens it's yeah, yes yes sir it, i forgot it, it's been a while since i've um but uh used them but yeah it's it's got a flat field of, flat field of view or something i believe does, does anybody know what i'm talking about or the visual visual um um people i don't know but it's been flat a while since I've, it's a flat field a flat field of view uh eyepieces is that what they call them uh or is it a field flattener no, the field flat. Yeah, the field flattener is pretty much the same thing. It uh, it helps the uh, outer edgy, outer edges. But I believe the eyepieces though that you um use, they have flat field um, flat field eyepieces instead of like the oval ones. That that that's the that's the main one. And another uh, are you um, uh, 
in any of the uh, astronomy groups on Facebook. There's um, some really good uh, smartphone uh, imaging groups that I'm, I'm even a, a part of that um, that can help you out with, the, with that more than I can. And I believe that they'll, they'll be able to help you out uh, with that uh, eyepiece thing I'm talking. They'll be able to tell you what I'm talking about or explain it to you better than I can because I, I, I kind of forgot what it was. I believe it's called the flat field uh, eyepiece. Okay, so uh, I would have like, got the perspective that it's some sort of issue with my lens. You know what this looks like to me? This looks like spherical aberration. Um, it's a four and a half inch reflector, right? Yes. That's a pretty good image with the four and a half inch. Uh, uh, it is. It's a very it really good image. Is. And, yeah. and the eyepiece has got, it's probably going pretty close to the edge mm -hmm. of the field of view. And it's kind of getting out of focus towards the edges. And uh, that's kind of looking like a spherical aberration from the primary mirror not being a proper um, uh, parabola. Yep, that could be it too. All right, actually I have another question here. Sure. Uh, it's about food. Would you recommend uh, 10 inches uh, Dobsonian to someone who is interested in variable star astronomy, or would you recommend another sort of a reflector or anything like that? Uh, recommend it for, for what kind of what kind, what variable star? Variable hmm. star astronomy. Yeah. Mm, um, not, hmm. Somebody might be able to help you out better than I can on that. I'm not too, um, too full. Are you a member of AAVSO? Uh, yes, I recently joined them. Okay. So, are you are you going to try to measure, do as, uh, astrometry, which is the measuring how bright the stars are, and measure the change in brightness? Or are you looking uh, at visual, just watching visually, watching them and and checking it? Actually, I started as an ambassador. My aim was to educate the children in Pakistan. So I oh, okay. know, uh, when, when I got to know a lot more about how the stuff works, I'm really interested in uh, how the spectrometry works. And I'm sort of into like understanding more into it. Excellent. It, it, you're, you're probably going down the right track right now. I wouldn't. Uh... You, know, you want to get serious about variable star observations and, and especially measuring that. Um, you, you might want to seriously consider going to a refractor, but the uh, I, yeah, I think you're doing fine. Uh, another thing that can be fun, of course, is, is uh, doing the spectrum of the stars and uh, there's a guy that uh, did a presentation here on the MAS YouTube channel uh, about um, the uh, uh, diffraction grading that you can get and how you can use that with a camera uh, to and some software to measure the uh, spectrum of individual stars, which uh, I think would be just, I'm, I'm just waiting to dive into that head first. I think that's going to be fun. Yeah, that interests me too. His, his name is Tom Field. He did the presentation October of 2020. It was a Zoom call. It's on our YouTube channel. So if you, yeah, if you're, if you're interested in that, definitely check that out. That kind of intrigues me too, doing um, some, like real science. I found what I was looking for on on those the flat field eye pieces. Here, here, here's the one I was talking about. If you can see it by chance, uh, it says a uh, planet, planetary. Let me back up so you can see it. Maybe there is this uh, flat field planetary uh, eye piece. Okay. Excellent. Those what are brand the, is that? That's a Orion. Um, let me see here. That is made from. It's a Orion. It's a 12.5 millimeter edge on flat field planetary eyepiece. Hmm. Let me see if I can lower my screen so you can see it better. Yeah, there it is. You can see it better. Yeah. So that's for, that's good for planetary and well, lunar. I think that would help him out with his edges on on his uh the those lunar images that he's trying to make. It'll it'll uh, knock out. Towards uh, focused, you know, 
throughout the whole image instead of uh, it doesn't have that curve in it to where it, the middle will be um, focused, you know what I mean? But the outer edges will be uh, at a different focus because of its shape. These flat field eyepieces will help out on that. Yeah. All right, I will definitely check it and I'll also see that podcast that you shared on the YouTube channel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, stay in touch with us. Post your definitely. images to our um, to our YouTube or to our Facebook group. We're curious to see where this journey takes you. Sure thing, Jeremy. I will keep you all updated. Definitely. Um, are you doing this? Yeah, yeah. No, we're. This is why we do this to to reach individuals like you who are kind of starting down this journey and a little younger than some of us, which is good. <laughs> so you have a brighter future. You have a future. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, got a couple other questions here from the the chat. What is the focal length, Drew? What is your focal length with your three X Barlow? Oh uh, well, um, my uh, my telescope's a twelve uh, twelve hundred millimeter, and then you uh, times that by three. What is that? Uh, um, 30, 36. 30, 36, 3600 with the um, with the uh, three times Barlow. Okay. Now, if if uh, conditions are bad, you know. And are kind of not as good as they're supposed to be. I'll ha I'll have to switch down to a two, you know, to a uh, two times Barlow because of the conditions. But the uh, the better the conditions, um, you know, the more magnification I can use. And I mean, I, I know I'm oversampling, but a little oversampling on planetary images is you know is recommended. Yeah. And then the other question is, how long will your plate form last before resetting? Um, it'll it'll track for for an hour. It'll go for about an hour. But like I got those LED lights on the bottom of my uh, my top plate, so I can kind of watch it just in case. You never know. But those motors, I mean, they only they only spin at one speed, and you know I, I can pretty much judge it by the time as well. But yeah, it's good for an hour, and it's a really good platform. Excellent. If there are any others, can you one more time the equatorial platform? Mm -hmm. What's the uh, the the resource where you get that? Um, that's going to be uh, hold on, let me look at it real quick. It's going to his name is Ed Jones, it, or it's an optical Eds. Optical and, Eds. Yeah, let me see if I can find it real quick. I had to wait on mine for about two years, but I mean, it was it was worth it. I mean, I was. Two years. Well, he only makes it. He doesn't make them in the in the wintertime. He only um, fabricates them in the summertime. And and if you want one, you put your name on a list. And uh, and he'll get if you if you're on the list, he's going to call you. You'll think, oh, man, he's not going to call me or whatever. And uh, I think I waited a little longer for mine was was because of the covid as well, because he ran out of materials because of the uh, the covid or whatever. But I, I might have had you might the regular wait time might be maybe six months or something, but because he only um, he only uh, fabricates them in, in uh, the the spring, some in the summertime. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, it's right here. It is right there. Optical Eds? Yes, sir. All right. We can just do a Google search for optical Eds. Mm -hmm. Ed Jones. He's a really Ed good Jones. dude, too. Yeah. Ed Jones. Mm -hmm. He also has a couple of uh, um, uh, YouTube uh, videos on how he even makes them himself. So if you wanted to make them yourself, but I mean, I, I'm not, I could make one now because I have one to go by. So um, I could make just one from scratch, but he he's also on YouTube as well. He he's pretty well known. I mean, in the in the uh, the platform, you know, circles. I like your T-shirt too, as well. <laughs> what do you think we yeah, got a chance to hear without Amari Cooper? I don't know, man. That 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 was really a downer right there, man. When they let let him go, I mean, he was one of my favorite players. You know, he didn't have that big ego. You know what I mean? He just yeah. went down there and got his touchdowns and did his job you know he was a well, good Dak, dude he and Dak had that connection i don't think they, they're going to they, be, they be they the really same did. without him put a lot of pressure on cd lamb to step up as the primary receiver so i don't know it's a weapons I heard, league now i heard marion barber uh passed away the other day as well 
Oh, you're after, kidding. Yes. I don't know uh, what, what, what the circumstances was, but yeah, they found him, um, found him uh, passed away in his apartment or his house or whatever. Like it was wow. this week. How old was he? He wasn't that old, was he? No, I think he was still like in his, maybe his upper thirties or something like that. He, he wasn't that old at all. Wow. That's really sad. You know, these guys, you just, yeah. you never know. I know it. Yeah. I don't know. It's going to be a different season. I think the Eagles are a lot better too. So it's going to be oh, a yeah. division this year. So I don't know. We'll hope for the best. Yep. All right, guys, it's coming up on 10 o'clock. Anybody got any other questions or comments for Drew? Excellent presentation. Very practical. Thank you very much, Drew. Well, yeah, thank y'all thank very you much. So thank much. you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Let me just go ahead and wrap up here. All right. Y'all have a good evening. Thanks, Drew. Have a All great right. evening. You do the same. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you. Uh, Again, our details, memphisastro.org. Check us out on Facebook, groups, slash Memphis Astro. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to our channel already, Memphis Astron Society. And, of course, join MAS if you're not on our email list, or you can just go to our website, memphisastro.org. And we should be back at MOSH next month. Or Again, we're taking this on a month-by-month -month basis. So we'll just kind of see what July brings. But... Other than that, we'll just go ahead and wrap up for tonight. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Nazir, welcome. I'm saying, Am I saying your name correctly? Nazir? Yes, this is Nasser. Nasser. Okay. Thank, uh, welcome to our group. Uh, very happy that you joined us tonight. Don't be a stranger. Stay in touch and definitely join our Facebook group. We, we're, we're eager to see your progress as you go and post your images, too. So. Thank you. It's an honor for me. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, guys. We'll go ahead and wrap up tonight, and we will see you next month. Take care. Have a good night.